Well, CC, you lived uh, a life of almost 18 years before World War II. Uh, tell me a little bit about your upbringing and your life before the war. Well, I was born in Little Rock, Arkansas in uh, 1922 and uh, graduated from Central High School there, the infamous building. After, that was after I left. But I graduated from high school in, uh, 19, in May of 1940. And by then, World War II was, uh, was already going on. It started September 1st, 1939, as you know. So in 40, when I went away to college, I knew to, I enrolled in the Wharton School in September of 1940, and the same day I enrolled, enlisted in the Naval ROTC. So I put on the uniform in 1940, and uh, I got out in 1946, so I had six years there. And uh, I was scheduled to graduate in 1944, but with the war going on, they accelerated our program. So in 1943, about May, I think, I received in the same day, I received my uh, diploma uh, graduation from uh, the Wharton School. I received uh, my commission in the Navy, and I received assignment to my ship, Destroyer Blue 744. Well, it, it, that begs the question, how do you go from the hallowed halls of Wharton to the South Pacific on the blue? How did that happen? Well, it, <laughs> the Naval Bureau of Personnel made it all happen because when I was in Naval ROTC, interesting point, near the, uh, the last year I was in the, in the ROTC, uh, they started, our instructors are naval officers. And they started reassigning these instructors of ours to ships. So they didn't replace them. My senior year, I was picked to instruct the freshman class in Naval ROTC in uh, communication and navigation. So with those two particular backgrounds in my naval training, uh, the Bureau of Personnel assigned me as communication officer on this new destroyer. We put it in commission in uh, 1944, and uh, it was the latest and biggest uh, 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 destroyer, 2,200 tons. We had three turrets of five-inch guns, two in each mount, two, three turrets, so we had six five-inch guns. We had 10 torpedoes. We had a bunch of depth charges. We had 20 millimeter anti-aircraft, 40 millimeter anti-aircraft. And we were fast and we were the largest and the newest ships in the fleet. So we were assigned to, within the Pacific to the fast carrier task forces. Okay. Now, you had to get all the way from, what, Pennsylvania? Is that Wharton in Pennsylvania? Philadelphia, All right. the way from Philadelphia to somewhere in the Pacific. Where was the blue and how did you get there? The blue was, uh, uh, I went on board the ship while it's still being in, in, in built when it's under construction in the Staten Island Navy Yard. And then we that ship, our ship was towed from there to the Brooklyn Navy Yard where it was fitted out. And I was on it all that time. And from there, Brooklyn, we went to a 30 day shakedown cruise, it's called, around Bermuda. We went back to, Brook, uh, to Brooklyn Navy Yard uh, for things that needed done. Well, that, that's what a shakedown cruise does. It tells you what equipment is needed to be changed or improved or s changed out, whatever. So we left Brooklyn Navy Yard and headed, after our shakedown cruise, down the East Coast through the Panama Canal and to Pearl Harbor. And uh, from there we joined the fleet. Where was the fleet at that time? Uh, it was uh, just north of the equator around Kwajalein. And, uh, I, and before, after I graduated, while the ship was being constructed during those four or five months, I went to four different radar schools. So I was the radar officer on my ship. 
I was a communication officer and I, had, I was in charge of Combat Information Center, CIC, and I was a fighter direction officer with all that, those schools we sent me to. I learned all that. And uh, during the war, I would direct, fighter, uh, direct the fighters uh, to intercept. We pick up on radar the Japs coming in, and I would direct our fighter cover to intercept them. That was my job. Okay. Now, in the course of all of that, after you met the fleet, you spent a lot of time at sea. <laughs> we, we know that. From then on, yeah. Yeah. But what... Now, let what, me, let yeah, me stop ahead. a second. Yes. I want to tell a, an interesting story that's not about me, but it, to me it's one of the most fascinating stories. We, I said we went to Pearl Harbor. Of course, I wasn't there at December 741, but <laughs> outside of the submarine nets to get into Pearl Harbor, there was a, an old four-stack World War I destroyer and doing patrol out there, to, patrolling for submarines, trying to get into Pearl Harbor through the nets. They would follow tugs in or ships going in. These submarines would follow them to be able to get through the submarine nets. Well, this old destroyer was named the Ward, and the captain of the Ward had been on board two days when he came on board December 6th. And December 7th, he had his, he was a young lieutenant. His name is William Allerbridge. And uh, a tugboat radioed to the ward saying they thought the submarine trying to follow them in. So the ward went over there and saw the submarine. They fired one shot right through the conning tire and sunk that submarine. But they never could verify that because there was no evidence the submarine sank. But about 10 or 12 years ago, this high technology we have now for underwater sur uh, surveillance or photography, they took a picture of this. It was a, it was a Japanese midget submarine. And in this photograph, published in the newspapers all over, there was this three or I don't know if they had a three or four inch deck gun. They only had one gun, it's manually fired, and they got right in the middle of that conning tower. So the ward fired the first shot in the Pacific in World War II. Fast forward three years to the day, December 7, 1944, we're operating off of the Philippines. And the uh, in October of 44 is when the Japanese first picked up the idea and the effort of kamikazes, just flying their airplanes into our ships. Well, the war was operating with the landing forces. We were with the fast carrier task forces. But the, so the old board was with these, giving support to the landing troops. A kamikaze hit the ward and practically sunk her. The, the captain ordered abandoned ship but the war didn't sink. So a new destroyer that joined the outfit was named O'Brien. The O'Brien was ordered to sink the ward. The captain of the O'Brien was William Outerbridge. <laughs> amazing. <laughs> Isn't that a fascinating story? I've never heard that. That's amazing. <laughs> he sunk his own whole, the, his first ship, he, he yes, sunk it. <laughs> okay, I'm, I diversed. We're, 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 where were we? Well, we're just going to talk in general about the campaigns that the, that you and the Blue were on in the Pacific. I know you had battle stars and, and uh, seven battle stars, and those battles were well the Philippines, of course, the start and uh, Peleliu, uh, Saipan, Guam, Tinian, Iwo Jima, and the seventh was Okinawa. That was our long, longest and toughest campaign. The second longest naval campaign in the Pacific, the first was Guadalcanal, and uh, operating around those waters with uh, several battles. Yeah. But uh, we weren't there at that time. We were in, uh, as I said, near the, the last battle was Okinawa. And uh, it, we, the troops landed April 1st, April Fool's Day, which also happened to be Easter Sunday. And uh, there were more ships and airplanes off of Okinawa 
than were anywhere else except in Normandy. And we had, but the kamikazes, the, from April 1st to June 22nd, that was an 82-day campaign, the Japanese flew 3,700 sorties against our fleet. Of those 3,700 sorties, 1,600 of them were kamikaze. They sunk over 100 of our, of our ships at Okinawa, um, we lost over 10,000 naval personnel on those ships, and uh, of though those ships, 10 were destroyers. There were more destroyers lost in World War II in all Europe and Pacific than any other, any other type ship. We lost uh, 73 destroyers. The second most was submarines, and we lost 52 submarines. Wow. And, and now, look. Let's talk about kamikazes. That's a fascinating uh, piece of the war that you experienced firsthand. Now, I know that there were uh, you you rotated uh, the, a ring kind of system around the. We fleet. call they called it radar picket okay. duty okay. ships, and uh, it made a circle around Okinawa because Jap uh, kamikazes came from everywhere, uh, Kyushu Island, just two or three hundred miles. Off from Okinawa, and in the circle of destroyers were numbered one at the north, closest to Japan, around 15. And out of this 82 campaign, our ship was assigned radar picket duty 22 times, and out of those 22 times, nine times, we were in radar picket station number one, which is closest to Japan, and the first ship that the kamikaze saw when they were coming to the fleet. And a lot of these pilots of the Japs were inexperienced, young, just <laughs> just had been, been trained as pilots. And uh, they see a destroyer, they think it's a battleship. So they attacked station number one more than any other. And uh, six, one of the times we were on station one was uh, April the 22nd, because the 16th, six days earlier, the Laffey had been on number one, and she was attacked by 22 kamikazes. Twelve of them hit her, and six of the bombs hit her, and she still was afloat, and it, same class destroyer as the Blue, my ship. It's the only, the, the Laffey is the only destroyer of our class still afloat, and it's uh, birthed over a uh, Charleston, South Carolina. Sue have been over there t to see that ship and go on board. It's a great experience. Did 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 the blue ever get targeted by a kamikaze? Well, yes, uh, by one. <laughs> out of all the times we were on the radar picket, these destroyers were sent out by them uh, with two destroyers at a time, uh, about sixty miles from the fleet between the fleet and Japan to give early warning. And also the carriers would send a, call it CAP, Combat Air Patrol would circle us. And when I would see a Japs coming in, I would radio our pilot, our uh, cap, and they would go intercept the kamikazes. Uh, but we, <laughs> our cap was four fighters and uh, the Japs would fly in these kamikazes a hundred at a time. So many of them passed us and went on the fleet, but many of them tried for the picket destroyers. Okay. Fascinating. <laughs> we never <laughs> did hit, and, and we, but there, so many on, on picket duty did. And as I said, we, we had one, we got a photograph of this bomb splash, oh, about 20, 30 yards off the ship. We shot there plane down and then beyond that is the plane crashing into the water. It's a great photograph and I still have it. The doctor on our ship, every ship in the Navy was issued a camera, a good camera. And our doctor didn't have anything to do but when we were at battle stations. So uh, he was the, he took pictures. I mean hundreds and hundreds of pictures. And this is one of them, great picture. Oh, by the way, we jumped up to the end of the campaign, uh, the last one being Okin Okinawa. Let's go back to uh, 1944, 
uh, when we joined the, the carriers, the fleet, and uh, in December 18th of that year, we were in the first of three typhoons. And in that typhoon, the first one, we lost three destroyers. And so that's over a thousand men uh, losing their ships. And uh, out of those that went into the water, mo I guess most of them went down with the ship, but there were 92 that we were able to pick up. Uh, our destroyer and two others were assigned the job of searching for these people. But the, uh, the waves were recorded uh, at over uh, 100 feet and uh, and the uh, wind velocity was recorded at uh, uh, no I have it backwards the wind velocity was over a uh, hundred miles per hour and the wave height was eighty feet and that was the typhoon that's what a typhoon is and we, as I said we lost three of our destroyers uh, but then we had a typhoon in in uh, Jan in January. January the 10th when we were in the South China Sea and uh, then in June, June the 5th we had our third typhoon and in that one the 100 feet length of the bow of the Pittsburgh broke off because these w water is so powerful coming down and the ship you'd go up and waves would come down this bow br broke off and it floated and uh my ship was assigned the job to take the bow of the Pittsburgh in tow, and the Pittsburgh was, she had watertight security, you know. They were still, they flo they're still afloat. The bow was still afloat. So in her own power, uh, the Pittsburgh went back to Guam at four knots, <laughs> and uh, we towed the bow at four knots for two days, and a ship, uh, a, a fleet tug, came out and relieved us towing, but we still went at four knots, but we were able then to go to six knots. We were damaged in the typhoon. We were also going to Guam for repairs, but uh, that was an interesting thing. We call that the Pit suburb of Pittsburgh, <laughs> and uh, that's, that was an interesting thing that happened. Well, after doing Peleliu and, 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 and Saipan and Tinian and Iwo, yeah, Iwo, and Iwo, Iwo was bad. And, and Iwo, all the all the great battles of the Second World War in the Pacific, and Okinawa. Uh, the blue ended up in Tokyo Bay, but the war wasn't over. <laughs> yeah, well, that, the way we wound up in Tokyo Bay, and uh, the, well, I'll go back. No, that we'd go there first. And July the 22nd, the, the, the surrender was August 15th, remember. So July the 22nd, my squadron of destroyers, nine destroyers, was, were detached from the carriers, from the carrier task force, from the fleet, to make a midnight run into Tokyo Bay. Nine destroyers, single file, full speed, and we ran in there and just for targets of opportunity, but also to see what sort of defenses we ha they had. And uh, so if uh, they sunk all of us within the, the uh, war planners and know what they had a tough job ahead. But we did, we, it was such a surprise to the Japs. We went in there and uh, we were credited with sinking uh, uh, two or three uh, cargo ships and couple of our other auxiliary ships and we went in there for at full speed for about 30 minutes and then we did a 180 and got out of there and we never got hit so uh, that was uh, about three weeks before the war's over but uh, so uh, we we were rejoined the fleet the carriers and we were uh, since March the B-29s and the carrier planes had been bombarding the, the mainland of Japan, Tokyo, all the industrial centers since March. So finally, in April the 5th, August the 15th, the Japs surrendered. That was at 8.30 on a morning, August 15th. 
at two o'clock uh, that afternoon, here came some kamikazes. And uh, the war had been over since 8.30 in the morning and everybody's happy, fat, dumb and happy. And so these ships started radioing a message to the uh, Admiral running in charge of the fleet said, what do we do with these kamikazes coming in? The war's over. And the Admiral sent a message back. He said, shoot them if you're attacked by hostile, he didn't say Japs or enemy, if you're attacked by hostile aircraft, shoot them down in a friendly manner. <laughs> <laughs> Which we did. So there were six in that uh, group and we shot, uh, our, our fighter plane shot them all down. Yes. Wow. And and so there you were, uh, basically around the Japanese home islands. Three weeks later, um, after you had been in Tokyo Bay, but yeah. but uh, or three weeks after the, the 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 surrender, they had the formal surrender. Yeah. And you were there. And, I, and uh, I, before talk about we that get that, and okay. that was September second. Yeah. But the four, they surrendered August the fifteenth. Something that's not known by anyone. On the August the 18th, MacArthur ordered the Japanese to send representatives in two Japanese bombers that Mar MacArthur had painted white with green crosses, uh, like Red Cross, but that type of cross. But these were green on a white two-engine Japanese bomber. And they flew the two of those down to uh, uh, I Shima, which is a little island off of Okinawa, which was a, mili uh, a military, uh, army and navy used that base just well, 10 miles off of Okinawa. These two jet planes landed there, and uh, then they were put, a, put aboard a MacArthur's airplane, <laughs> his name he put on his airplane, was a four-engine American bomber called the Baton. So here these Japs were getting on. He made a point of that. Well, they flew them down to Manila for, to get all their instructions what they were to do. One interesting thing MacArthur required them to do when they came back to, went back to Japan was take all the propellers. There were no jets then. All the propellers off of all the airplanes parked around the country, everywhere. And uh, so that some fanatic couldn't take off and try to do some kamikaze action. So um, interesting thing, MacArthur never met these in, uh, envoys or ambassadors from Japan. They came down to get their instructions on what was to be done. And when when we were going in with land troops and flying in troops. They went over all that, but MacArthur did not meet them. Interesting thing, uh, his chief of staff was a, a, a Marine general named Donald Sutherland. Uh, now we go up to the surrender September 2nd. Uh, we were anchored about a thousand yards off the starboard quarter of uh, the uh, Missouri. So with binoculars, I could see the ceremony and uh, they broadcast all the proceedings to the fleet. So I heard it and w watched it. So I saw the, uh, and I go back to General Sutherland on the, that was the second. On the 4th of September, we received orders to go alongside the Missouri to pick up Jim MacArthur as chief of staff and take him over to Yokohama Japanese Naval Base, which we, we are occupying everything but then, of course. But I don't know, he had some job to do over there, so we went over, picked him, went over to the Missouri, picked up the general, and took him over there. Uh, the uh, surrender ceremony, interestingly, only lasted two minutes. MacArthur spoke that, the only one that spoke was MacArthur for two minutes. And not, no other American or uh, British, anybody spoke. Uh, MacArthur then signed the surrender and uh, gave the pins to some uh, couple of his generals. Skinny Wainwright was one of them, I remember. And then seven other Allied 
representative sign, a British and Australian and, and Russian. And uh, so then, uh, there were, as I said, no Japanese signed it. There were 11 of them in that Japanese contingent. And they stood in two rows opposite the desk where MacArthur was seated. The most uh, memorable and impressive thing that happened that day, when the cer ceremony was over, 1,600 airplanes did a flyover over Tokyo Bay. The first 600 are B-29s. They flew over at 3,000 feet. The next 1,000 airplanes were Army and Navy and Marine, fighters, bombers, uh, torpedo, everything. 1,000 of those at 1,500 feet. So here was this black cloud of airplanes and all the noise of that many airplanes at, 50, at, at that low level. And that was very impressive and very memorable. That, that, for anybody who's not uh, knowledgeable about that, is what we call VJ Day, Victory Over Japan. Yeah, that was a yeah. big day in the history of World War II, and you were there. Uh, now, uh, a lot of people, the war in Europe was already over. They were coming home, and, and even the people in the Pacific were coming uh, back in the fall. You didn't get back in the fall. Uh, tell, tell us about what happened after VJ well, Day. Well, it was nothing memorable. It's just yeah. the fact that... I was on the ship. The ship came back to the States, to Bremerton, Washington, for major overall. They gave us 30 days leave, went back to the ship, and, uh, and then we did some training exercises off of California. Then we went to Pearl Harbor, and uh, by then it was uh, May of 46, and uh, the ship after Pearl Harbor was assigned to China Station. So the day my ship, I was discharged from the ship at Pearl Harbor, and my ship left for China. <laughs> so I, I was able to get off in time before they left. And uh, so I stayed two or three weeks in the bachelor officer quarter in, in uh, Pearl Harbor, waiting for transportation back to the States. So finally I was discharged in May of 46. But you were still in the reserves, weren't you? Yeah, I stayed in the reserves. <laughs> I, I stayed in the reserves until uh, 1945. Five years later, the U.S. went to war in Korea. And I was called back into active duty. And ironically, I was on a small ship, a destroyer in the Pacific. My assignment for the Korean War was the battleship Missouri in the, in the Atlantic. So I thought that was naval uh, logic or lie, something planning, you know. Big ship uh, Atlantic, small ship Pacific. Uh, but anyway, I, went, I had to go to Washington to beg out of that because but then I, I had a family and I, I had my own business and they let me out, said, but you got to get out of the reserve. So I said, I'll do that. Well. Uh the obvious question, having been through the war with you, um, uh, you were you were at all all the great all the great conflicts of the Pacific, uh, other than perhaps Guadalcanal. And yeah, the, in the, the early things. stages, yeah. like Cor Battle of Coral right, Sea right, and, and uh, Cape Esperance, right. those around Guadalcanal right. in '42. Right. But then after that, you you were part hit, of it. Hit and, most of them. Yeah, and and uh, so I, I guess my final question would be um, musing on that. Uh, uh, your thoughts about your part in the war, your part, thoughts about the war uh, and what it meant. Well, of course, it, we were effective. The, the, the naval fleet in, in the air operations that won, uh, that won the war out there. Uh, uh, but uh, my job was, uh, it was interesting. Uh, not only did I have this battle uh, station assignment in CIC, with the radars and uh, all the men I had working for me there, I had to stand watch. I was a qualified deck officer, and uh, I had control or con of the ship for four, hour, four hours on and four hours off, so there's not much time for rest, because during the four hours off, the Japs would come in with kamikazes 
or if it's night, what we call bed check, bed check Charlie would fly around and we didn't know when, when he's ever going to come in. So he just fly around. So we'd have to stay at battle stations. So the one th word, one thing I remember most about being at war in the Navy, ground troops, something entirely different, as you, of course, was fatigue. Just never could get enough rest or sleep. Fatigue. That was the overpowering thing. Okay. Years on the water, fatigue. Yeah, people don't understand what life on, on a ship like the Blue was for years. We talk about the campaigns, but the daily life yeah. is what well, you're Well, you're, you're, you're fighting to get a chance to rest, it, get in your bunk. Uh, I, as a junior officer, I was, we, we had, an officer's headquarters, we had a, a compartment for three officers, three bunks, and I had the top bunk, and it was right next to the steel deck outside, so the Pacific Sun made that like a heating element there, and I had that top bunk, so I had an electrician may put a fan on the stanchion that held the bunk up, that fan blew on me all the times. Only thing kept me alive, but I could not sit up in that bunk. I had to climb up over the first two and roll in, and then roll out to get out of it. But uh, we, there were three officers' compartments back in this little passageway, so the, the, there were three, and then the executive officer, executive officer was by himself. So the seven of us, and we had one shower and lavatory and toilet. For the for us, so we had a pretty good deal. Yeah, but you also worked probably in a, in a sort of a dark area working CIC because you were looking at. Well, radar. that was at battle station. I was yeah. talking about where I was yeah. bunking. Yeah. Where, but yeah, up forward when I go to battle stations, we were just down below the bridge, and we had a big compartment, no no uh, portholes, no. Uh, it was dark in there all the time. Yeah. Right. Right. Because of these radar scopes. We had to keep it dark. Wow. Any final word? The war, your experience, what it meant? Anything would you want to say? Well, uh, I think I pretty much said it all. Okay. I, uh, I, I, I was honored to serve our country. And it's, it's a visceral part of my life, of course, the, the experience. And you should be proud. Yeah. Thank you, C.C. Colley. Uh, this has been a wonderful session. Good. Thank you very much. Good.